we have three terrific guests. Um, and to introduce them, at the bottom left of my screen is Martha Guzman Aceves, who Jerry Brown, the governor of California, appointed her to the Public Utilities Commission in 2016. And her main focus, focus area has been broadband access and equity. And before she was a commissioner, she had 20 years of policy experience. She worked for the United Farm Workers. She worked for the California Rural Legal Assistance uh, Foundation. And she was uh, Governor Brown's Deputy Legislative Affairs Secretary. And in the blue shirt at the top left of my screen is Jeff Blackwell. He's a member of the Creek Nation, and right now he's the Chief Strategy Officer and General Counsel at Amerind, which is a firm that's the only 100% tribally owned provider of insurance solutions in Indian country. And they have about $14 billion worth of infrastructure, physical uh, infrastructure, buildings, things like that, under their management. And most of it is on the wrong side of the digital divide. And before he came to Amerind, Jeff was the inaugural founding chief of the Federal Communications Commission's Office of Native Affairs and Policy. There wasn't one before him, he invented that office. And to my right uh, is Ejal Casaparalta. She's a, now a project manager at Amerind. Jeff recently hired her, and she helps tribal nations develop and deploy broadband internet. She brings extensive experience in telecommunications and infrastructure affairs because she started a law firm in Denver that was devoted to these issues. And this is who's gonna be talking to you. And I just wanna start it out with a really general question about what the situation is now. Ajal, could you start, and everybody can jump in, could you start and describe what it means in the middle of the COVID pandemic not to have broadband in, rur in the rural West? Well, thank you so much for the invitation, Phyllis. It is great to speak with you and to be in company with such incredible, um, I think, thought leaders and, um, and you know, political leaders in our sector. Um, so I think the question that you pose first, um, you know, it's really what's at the core of why we should care about the digital divide. Um, and I want to start by saying that the importance of this question um, has sometimes and um, for a while eluded us as to what is the real impact if you don't have internet service. Um, but the COVID-19 pandemic really hit us with uh, the you know, importance of this question. Um, and rather than describe to you and everyone listening um, what a life without broadband is, I kind of want to invite everyone to think about their life um, and the presence of the internet in every single aspect of their everyday lives. Um, I want you know everyone to think about how you use the internet from the minute you wake up to the minute you fall asleep. Um, and then also sometimes we use it while we're sleeping, right? We're having some type of device that tracks our, our uh, biometric data. Um, but also think about how you use the internet uh, during the weekdays, um, during the weekends, and in your work life, in your personal life, about the life that you want to live, uh, like your educational goals, your romantic goals, your relaxation goals, your financial goals. Um, think about all of those things um, and how you use the internet. For me, for example, I wake up, first thing I do is pick up my phone and I check social media. Um, that's how like it really jump starts my day. Um, and I go to sleep looking at social media. Um, but you know, on more, uh, and, and more consequential issues like um, uh, educational opportunities, there is no possible way for anybody to apply to law school right now without a stable internet connection. You can't even take the LSAT anymore without having a reliable internet connection. The LSAT this year turned from a paper exam to a digital exam. The uh, bar exam is all uh, online. I mean, studying for the bar takes place online. So anything from applying to jobs, um, applying to scholarships, applying to schools, um, and, and jobs ranging all sectors, right? Applying to a gas station job. Also, you need to fill out, likely fill out an, a digital form. 
So think about all those things in your personal work life, romantic life, um, your financial life, how you uh, purchase groceries, how you bank. Uh, a lot of us bank online. Um, and now I think what is really critical in this kind of analysis of what we do with the internet during every day of our, you know, every moment of our lives, it's also realizing that because our platforms have moved on uh, online and become digital, a lot of the options that we had, like paper forms, are no longer there. So now think about how do I live my life without the internet and without the paper option, right? So I think that if we invite um, you know, the audience to think about how the internet um, is present in every minute of their lives, we can paint a better picture as to why, uh, what happens when you don't have internet service. Thank you so much. That's, <laughs> that's an important thing to think about. Commissioner, you've uh, worked with this for, uh, for three or four years now, very intensively. Tell us what you see in rural America or elsewhere in America where there's no internet. Yes, thank you, uh, Felicity, yes. And, you know, I think now more than ever, the things we saw before that all of us kind of in rural California, rural America have seen are more heightened than before. Certainly as we are now in fire season here in California, um, the ability to know if a fire is coming, the ability to plan, and is certainly the ability to evacuate is so uh, eminently important for your most essential thing, which is protecting your own life. So the, that's the most extreme obvious need, in addition to all the ones we know in terms of education, the educational gaps and divides that exist. But really, when it comes to actual um, health and safety and you're, you're saving your own life, it, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the need to have connectivity to be able to to be able to communicate with each other. And we saw the impacts of not having proper connectivity, even when infrastructure was in place, but not having the right um, pieces in place, frankly, uh, for all the fires that happened most recently in, in Northern California. So we're, we've learned from that and we've um, been uh, attempting to do different things not, that we'll hopefully talk about more today. But, but really, when we think about why does rural California, rural America need connectivity? It's just the most essential thing. And, and today as you sit in, and I talk to you today as we prepare for our public safety power shutoffs to prevent fires uh, and how we can retain uh, connectivity during those shutoffs is a major focus for us. Um, so all of it comes back to, um, you know, not just essential services that rely on, on connectivity, but really to be able to protect our own lives um, during these types of, of emergencies. Thank you so much. Jeff, how big a problem is this? How many people don't have broadband? What do we know about that? What don't we know and why? Oh my goodness. Well, first, Heshje um, Chukma, so uh, about Jeffrey Blackwell. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, Felicity, uh, Commissioner uh, Guzman Aceves, and of course, EJL. Uh, um, I think that the, this, this gathering around this issue uh, that involves rural America and tribal America, uh, there is so much that we have in common about the lack, you know, the predicate, the causes of the lack of broadband. Um, I want to make sure that p folks know that um, it's not just uh, from former work at the FCC and currently at Ameren. Uh, but also, um, now that I'm back in Indian country, uh, the tribal leaders have appointed me to be the co-chair of the National Congress of American Indians Technology and Telecommunications Subcommittee. So NCAI is sort of the largest uh, umbrella intertribal government organization in the United States. And, um, you know, one can take a look at the maps. The, the FCC has a national broadband map that was started in the, in the, um, Recovery Act era and was at the Department of Commerce and then transitioned over to the FCC. Um, but it is not accurate. I, I will tell you, it is not an accurate map. And it's inaccurate for a couple of reasons. One is that it's very industry driven. It's a map that is pulled from data that is, uh, comes from reports that, that uh, the major private corporations in the United States that deploy broadband 
have to report to the FCC, and it's data that is not double checked. Uh, for a long period of time, it, the predicate to it was not double checked. So when it comes to to our lands, our our tribal lands, and uh, right now I'm I'm sitting on the the pueblo of Santa Ana uh, in in um, sort of the northern third of uh, of New Mexico. It really is inaccurate, but it's not just inaccurate, it's at how it is inaccurate. So there are certain areas based on certain census designated areas that the carriers report data. And if there is a service offering in that area, it is treated as covered. It doesn't take into account cost, it doesn't take into account other accessibility issues. Um, and if there's any service offering, it's treated as being covered to that speed. So it is, a, it is a map that I've had the pleasure to testify about before Congress that I, it, it, it's, it's difficult for folks to understand that it's inaccurate in that it's almost aspirational. Um, what we really need is a meets and bounds, region by region, county by county, tribe by tribe map that not only maps the deployment, but also maps the issues as to why there is not available broadband. And uh, I feel very fortunate to be on a call with a, com with a state commissioner. I had to, the great honor of being able to work with a number of them when I was at the FCC. And I am sure that the commissioner knows, as, as Agile and I do, that one of the major challenges is that there are missing pieces to the puzzle. That there are parts of rural America that don't have, we may have the super highway of technology going across, but we don't have that state highway of technology. And we certainly don't have the county road of technology. And maybe those of us that are on dirt roads, that's not even imaginable yet. But uh, how do you get through just a second, that? Jeff. Go ahead. Let me interrupt for just a second and ask the commissioner, what is, because uh, we're talking, I mean, I'm a generalist and, and I think many of our audience are generalists. What is the best technology to get broadband to rural America, and then we can get back to, to Jeff and the state and county roads he's talking about. What is the technology that's that's best? Well, um, I think it, the road analogy is a good one because uh, roads and highways need to be fiber. Um, you know, I think there's, um, for some reason, we get into this uh, cost theory analysis, which is not always founded in truth, and um, from where I sit in, in the ability to see the energy infrastructure, any place that has power in California, which is an overwhelming majority, although there still are some tribal lands primarily that are unserved, but any place that has power should have fiber because the cost of laying that uh, in relation to, and it, takes, it will take a lot of coordination and um, a lot of intention from the top to make it work, but um, you know, we have a lot of terrains that are difficult, but we have a lot of terrains that are difficult that have power. So there's not really, uh, when we talk about what the goal is and where we should be aiming, it certainly could be phased. You know, you take the fiber out a few more miles every time that you can. You have to have a budget, obviously. But the goal should be fiber. And, you know, maybe you build it out a couple of miles in and then you have to use some fixed wireless to meet those external ends. And the next year you build out more fiber and those fixed wireless connections get shorter and shorter. We just uh, funded a project here uh, this year that's been a long time in the work. They actually had a horrible story of some federal dollars that were removed from them. But up north here in California where the Karuk and the Yurok are, uh, we're funding um, $11 million of over 225 miles of need. We cannot put all 225 miles forward at once. But this is a perfect example where you put out as much fiber, certainly connecting the highways, they need to get connected to the actual big network and that should be fiber. And so as they continue to grow out, get their own, hopefully their own system going there, their own service and, pr and providing for themselves ultimately, we'll be able to build on that and, and have a more sustainable infrastructure. Jeff and Edgel, could you explain for, for everybody, me included, your analogy to roads, what is the architecture of fiber and what are they, they're, they're things that I, uh, terms I keep seeing like middle mile and last mile. 
to explain what the commissioner was talking about, what exactly are we talking about in terms of what kind of fiber there is and what connects to what else? Go ahead, Adia. Jeff. You want to take the first part of that or you want yeah. me to? Sure. So the internet is really a huge network of cables that are actually strung all around the world, um, including submarine cables that connect uh, continents. So I, I just want to pick up on what the commissioner said. If we have electricity on mountains and if we have submarine cables across ocean floors, then surely we can figure out how to deploy fiber uh, throughout uh, the country. Um, so you have, you know, these segments that connect a huge submarine cable. Somebody connects to that cable. If you think, I guess, um, of, of that as a row, then somebody picks a smaller cable and strunks it along a highway um, or along across state lines. Um, but they don't necessarily stop at every single town. Um, and, you know, picking on the, on the highway analogy, so they can string that fiber cable along the highway and go across state. And then somebody else builds a ramp <laughs> off the highway and they start creating, you know, more um, uh, smaller roads into uh, within a state and within that state, within a town. Um, and ultimately, uh, it's a series of um, cable pieces that lead to like the edge of your town or um, and there's the last mile what, to pick up on one term. The last mile is somebody who says, well, this cable got to the edge of my town, but is not serving any of the homes in my town. So I'm going to put in an investment uh, with whatever partnership model is available and string that wire from the edge of the town to my home. So that's one option. Jeff, what did I leave out? Yeah. So, so yes, I, is the biggest problem the last, I'm sorry, go ahead, the last one. I mean, the one, of the, one of the important things to, to demystify is the actual technology here. So, so fiber, imagine this pin is, is it's flexible glass. It is, it is glass that has an amount of flexibility and it can take, it takes light through it and it can take the full uh, spectrum of light. It can take the full rainbow of light through it. So the reason why fiber, and I agree completely with everything the commissioner said, the reason why fiber is such an important priority for rural and tribal America is that this is really the Valhalla of technology right now. It has fairly limitless possibility. It is dependent on the quality of the equipment that is put on both sides. So to stick with the roads, and let's use an auto analogy, if, if I wanted to put a Yugo at either end, or maybe, maybe folks remember the old VW bug. If I put an old VW bug at both ends, that you're gonna get that kind of speed and reliability and capacity back and forth. If we put a Maserati, or if we put you know, a Ferrari at both ends, you're getting that kind of speed. But what you're really talk, talking about is getting a double, a triple long 18 wheeler that can go 90 to 100 miles an hour, so you're carrying that kind of capacity at that speed. Now the roads analogy is one that's relevant because we all drive roads, right? So you know that your major interstate highway, there is, like, like as you all said, there are major big trunk lines of capacity and fiber that run basically coast to coast. And if you were to look at a map, they would look like a lattice work across the country. And you would think, okay, these are kind of obvious areas. Uh, you know, um, St. Louis to the east and St. Louis to the west. Um, and then, so that's your major interstate. And then state highways would be from that major, that it would be relevant. Let's use the analogy of a rural community. You know, you're a hypothetical rural community that's 60 to 70 miles off of the major interstate highway. So you're going to take a state highway. Well, in America, we are lacking, in Indian country, we know that that middle mile fiber, middle being middle between the community where, as Ajal said, it, it comes to an end and then it's distributed to homes, that would be the last mile or what people call the last mile. But that middle is in between the community and the major highway. We're lacking about 8,000 miles of middle mile fiber on tribal lands in the United States. 
one of the major problems right now is that the federal programs that address broadband needs, they're really predicated in an old telephony world, in an old telephone world. And right now, the last 10 years, what the federal government's been uh, endeavoring to do and states have been endeavoring to do is kind of upgrade those old programs, which are essentially subsidy mechanisms for companies that are gonna build out that middle mile. They're trying to upgrade those to cover broadband costs like fiber. But anybody from rural America, if you're, if, if somebody is trying to sling lingo with you and talk telecom ease, don't let them do it. These are, these are construction projects, just like any other construction project, except they run over long distances. And instead of brick and mortar, they're power lines, as the commissioner said, they're radio waves, they're towers, and they're things like fiber. So hopefully that helps paint a picture. No, that's great. I really appreciate that. And Commissioner, obviously local communities are going to know best what their needs are, what their maybe their topography, whether it's desert or mountains or whatever, what, what, it, what it is, and may be best able to run the, to, uh, to know how to get broadband to local residents. But there are legal obstacles. Can you talk a little bit about the kind of obstacles that have been built that make it hard for local communities uh, to take charge? Sure. I mean, I think fortunately in California, we don't have a prohibition. Some states have a prohibition of local governments being the internet service provider, and that's a huge limitation. We don't have that here. We have been limited in actually what Jeff was talking about, which is that most of our funding, including some of the federal funding that comes down, uh, but mo we have six public purpose programs here in California, and those are in just urgent need to, of reforming them to be internet-based programs to incentivize the build out of internet and not these old structures which are a subsidy to the incumbent providers for a voice service. So we are really in the midst of trying to reform those programs and and one of the, one of a small example is one of our statutory limitations on our broadband infrastructure program is that we cannot fund the local government until the incumbents have said that they are, have exhausted their speculation there. It's like- That what? they're not interested. <laughs> yeah, and they never say they're not interested. They just drag it on and drag it on. So we've been really trying to educate the legislature that, you know, they were sold this, message by the incumbents, which was don't, um, you know, don't subsidize the local government or anybody for that matter, if, if there's already a provider there. Well, as Jeff said, they're, they're providing maybe to one household, but not the whole community. And, and don't just, uh, just subsidize us so that we can then build out quicker and we can match our federal funds and, and optimize it. So, you know, they made a great pitch about why they were the ones to receive this funding. And just as an example, uh, we had a provision that really constrained us from funding anybody until AT&T and Frontier exhausted their CAF-2 federal funding. AT&T did not apply for $1 of state funding infrastructure, $1. So we waited for two years for AT&T to optimize their federal investment and you know all these areas that many of you across the nation are now very familiar with, you know the community of paradise and just north of it, all of these areas that time after time would ask AT and T, can you just say no, we're not we're not going to build here, so we can pursue the state funding, and they wouldn't. So we're finally done with that, and and that's fortunately we're in a good place where we have lots of solicitations, and now we're in in a in a situation where we've exhausted, we're getting ready to exhaust our state funding. And, and that maybe gets to another point, which is in addition to statute, we need more funding and, and the need for, again, these programs to really be focused on building out the broadband. That's, that's fascinating I, that AT&T just wouldn't say, no, I'm not gonna build, just, you know, two years, get lost while they decide to say that. And Joe, that's, the commissioner and, and uh, Jeff were both talking about financial issues. You've, as, a, as an attorney, before you went to Amarind, you've seen local communities try to deal with a financing problem. Fiber is expensive. 
It may not be the only solution, but all broadband solutions tend to be expensive. Where do people get the money? And can you tell any success stories? Well, and, and before I turn to maybe some finance, uh, you know, options that local governments or smaller rural areas have taken on, um, I want to say that unfortunately in Colorado, um, our state did listen to the telecommunications industry talk point about not allowing local governments to compete with them, right? They said it's some free competition. So um, over 12 years ago, uh, the state passed uh, Senate Bill 152, which required any municipality in Colorado, if they wanted to um, uh, create their own internet network, they wanted to provide their own broadband solution because nobody was doing it, they would need to put it up for, uh, for a vote. Um, before they could start planning this. So it didn't outright ban the use, uh, you know, municipal broadband development in the state, but it just, uh, you know, put in this hurdle um, saying, okay, before you, before city of Longmont, city of Boulder, city of, um, you know, uh, Montrose, uh, all cities, I think, that started their own municipal broadband plans. Um, before you want to uh, begin even thinking about the financial challenges or the technology challenges, um, you need to make sure that your constituents agree with this option. Um, so apparently about 100, over 100 communities throughout the state have voted to consider um, the, uh, to allow the municipality to build their own um, network. And, you know, financing is one of those um, huge challenges. I'm not an economist, so I can't speak to the details of how people have figured out how to do this. Um, there's a variety of, of funding sources that come and go. Um, right now, as you know, as the commissioner mentioned, each state might have their own fund um, that a small uh, provider or a municipality can tap into, maybe. Um, the Federal Communications Commission has um, several, uh, has the Universal Service Fund, that's another option. Um, I know uh, Rural Utility Service also has various um, uh, grants, uh, opportunities. Um, that's the Agriculture Department Service, you mean? That's right, yeah, USDA, yeah. Um, and, you know, currently we are, um, the FCC is holding the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, which I think we should, um, maybe we could talk about it a little bit later because it's about to this, um, it's, it's, a pot, it's a pot of $20 billion that is going to be distributed for rural broadband deployment in, um, in the U.S. But all of these are, are really set up for large carriers. Right, they're really set up kind of like what the commissioner said. Um, well, we want to hear from large carriers first, and if they don't want this money, maybe we'll open it up. Um, and so the obstacles are huge. What we've seen, um, what I've seen uh, communities have to resort to is that they don't necessarily build their own huge project. I mean, many have built their own very successful um, uh, municipally owned broadband networks um, in smaller or mid-sized cities. Um, but some, it's up to the institutions in the area. So for example, in West Texas, uh, there is a rural school district that, that during the pandemic realized none of our students have internet service and we need to literally buy towers and contract with a provider to help us bring the internet to our students' homes. Um, so you see some of that, of those like kind of desperate attempt solutions at closing the digital divide. Um, we mentioned municipalities, um, electric cooperatives are also part of the equation, but they're all vary, right? Depending on what's possible and what's available. Um, tribes are stepping up to the challenge using spectrum and uh, Jeff can talk a little bit about that as well, about the use yeah, of, Jeff. yeah. Go ahead, Jeff and, and uh, the commissioner too, but Jeff, can, can you talk about how much money has been given out? Um, Agile talked about the, the new uh, Rural Opportunity Fund. Um, if that is handled the same way as the other money has been handled, will it make a difference? And how much money has been given out over the last quarter century or so? Biblical amounts of money, billions. I mean, um, what do you got? How much, what, what's in the treasury? So, so, so I am, um, I worked twice at the FCC. I worked for almost 13 years there. And 
starting in the summer of 2000, the FCC started trying to pay the major wireless carriers in the United States to build out on tribal lands and created something called the tribal lands bidding credit. Literally in the summer of 2000, the commission created a rule that if a tribe were to come to an agreement with a carrier, allow you know, entry onto lands and for whatever the, whatever the infrastructure costs were to cover 70, 75%, the, the number grew and, and shrunk a little bit during those years, that the FCC would give the carrier a credit in future spectrum auctions at the FCC. Now what that meant is it gave them a voucher to use for licensing at the commission. So it's in direct funding, the FCC's universal service fund is about $11.5 billion a year. About half of that goes to corporate, operational, and capital expenditures. And then there are three other programs that are for low-income persons, for healthcare, and for education. And um, those were codified in the Telecommunications Act of 1996. So we're coming up on the 25th anniversary of that. We've been pumping billions. I'll tell you what I told the chairman of the FCC. We've been pumping billions into these programs and it's only gotten us this far. And why? It's the very reason that is behind what the commissioner said. The major industries, this is not their business model. Rural America, tribal America is not their business model. Their business model is where there is large population density and where there is relative affluence compared to rural America. So one of the major hallmarks of the Telecom Act is, was intended to answer your question, and it was to create a competitive framework. Some of us are actually old enough to remember Ma Bell and that there used to be a monopoly in the United States, and then a monopoly was broken up to try to create uh competition competition was going to rule the marketplace it was going to push costs down it was going to push technology out but those of us from rural america know that we don't have the kind of population density and and in fact over that same 25 years we've seen a lot of major corporations move into america and i don't mean to cast aspersions here but there have been a lot of mom and pops that have been put out of business by like the walmarts of the world so we're seeing we're seeing rural America, really the economics of rural America getting stressed. So we know, it's funny, um, Commissioner, uh, in 2011 into 2012, when I was at the commission, we, we created some, a mechanism, that, that the commission created a mechanism called a reverse auction. And that is what the RDOF is, the Rural Development Opportunities Fund. What the commission has done is it's identified $20 million that it's going to make available to companies and they have to come up with competitive model framework. Like it's not the lowest contract, lowest bidder wins type government model contracting. It's more, what is the best deployment? Now I'm very, I'm very worried about that because I told you earlier, the map sucks. We've got a bad map. So it's kind of a real $20 billion fire ready aim. And let's see if we get something out there. Um, but um, when it comes to the money that's been spent, to answer your question probably more directly, Felicity, there's been billions that have been spent and we still have significant communities. Um, my suggestion is that we refine or change. We need new programs at the federal level that are aimed at this technology and these gaps, not those gaps. And some of that may, some of those legislative intents to address education and healthcare, those may stay the same, but the United States has already paid for certain networks three and four and five times over. Do we really need to, the world, the conversation right now nationwide is 5G for those that live in rural America. 5G can't, we can't contemplate it yet because we can't, the predicate to it isn't there for us. So my hope is that we can in the coming years actually get some new authorizations and new programs that are aimed at rural and tribal America specifically. Thanks. So commissioner, two questions for you then. One is somebody I talked to when I was reporting a, a blog piece on this said that the question the nation has to answer is, do we connect everybody or not? 
And so two questions for you. One, based on what you told me uh, when we talked a little earlier, which is there are some counties in California that are very rural counties that have this problem, but the leaders, the county councils or the, the mayors or whoever, don't treat broadband as a utility. And therefore, it's going to be difficult to get them to provide uh, support for programs that will uh, create a utility. And second, can we just plain afford, whether it's fiber or fiber to microwave or, or uh, low earth orbit satellites or all these fancy new technologies that, that might be out there, can we afford to get everybody broadband? Mm. Well, I would say that actually, uh, the need um, in the view of this being a utility by the local governments and rural governments in, in California is there. I think the, um, you know, above the local government, the state and federal in particular kind of infrastructure isn't really doing that. They would, every day we hear of new um, leadership in local government who wants to take this on. You know, they've they come to us and, and they are the ones that know, even in areas where there's a little more density, let's say a, a town that's like 20,000 or so, and parts of the town are served, but the outer parts of the town are unserved. And they're, they're in this conundrum of constantly begging the provider to extend out to the entire community. So I think, I think the local governments are actually, the leadership there wants to do more uh, they certainly would like us to use any sort of regulatory authority to do that, and we're not able to do that. We're preempted. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. You say you're preempted. How are you preempted? Well, unfortunately, when uh, the Trump administration came in and put Chairman Pai in, in place, Chairman Pai uh, swiftly said that the Internet was not a telecommunication service and that it was the jurisdiction of, of uh, uh, not, it was not the jurisdiction of the FCC. Not the jurisdiction of the states, and and so we we have this kind of underlying uh, premise uh, on our federal construct that that the internet is not a public utility. It's not even a telecommunication service, and 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 that's starting at the very top. And so, if anything, you know, we need a change in November for that to get clarity to say we need to treat this as a, the basic essential service that it is and, and not to uh, have us uh, treat it in, in a way that, that the, only the free market can address it. We know that's not the case and particularly in these areas. I do wanna share, um, I'm going away from your question a little bit, but I, I do wanna say a couple of factoids about California, which is that 23% um, of California households do not have access to the internet. Some of that is because they can't afford it. Some of it's because it doesn't exist. So that's about uh, 2 million Californians that don't have uh, access to high speed, 100 megabits down speed. We don't have that. Uh, rural households, 50% of California rural households don't have that 25 speed. So 25 megabits down, three up. 50% of rural households, it's like, it's atrocious. and. We have a lot of tribes here in California. We're currently working with, we currently track 149 federally and state recognized. They're not all federally recognized tribes. And of those, 30% of those tribes are unserved at speeds below six down one up. So the tribal areas in California are a very particularly of rural areas. Some of, some of the tribes are in urban areas, but the rural tribes in California are one of our most and yeah. hardest to serve areas. And so we're kind of doubling down there. And, and just last week we approved some technical assistance to going out to the tribes, but this is an area that the free market economics theories are not gonna work. We wanna see uh, tribal sovereignty and helping them do what they wanna do. If they wanna create their own uh, carriers, if they wanna become their own carriers, that's where we should head is probably the most sustainable option. And that goes for many of our rural areas as well. And, uh, and there's all these iterations in between, you know, they could help build that infrastructure and then have multiple carriers come on top and offer competition around it. So there's no, it doesn't have to be kind of just all 
financed with public dollars and gold plated all around. That's not what we're talking about here, but we need to have a, a component of this has to be public. I told you we should go towards uh, the federal money. California gets like, you know, $3 out of 10 of the money that we put in. So 30 cents on the dollar that we contribute. We're not getting our money back in California. We need block grants to the states. We need to give that money to more than just the incumbents. We see a huge role for local governments and tribal governments, and it doesn't all mean they can do public-private partnerships. They can make that one public dollar go to $10. There's so many solutions here um, that, that we, can, we can build fiber. It's not really that we can't afford fiber. It's, it's really that old saying that we really can't afford not to build fiber. And so that's, um, that's a lot there. But I think really we, we are, we're limiting ourselves in this old construct and we don't need to do that anymore. And, and much of that will depend on, on some federal change, but also we could do a lot at the state side uh, while we wait for that to try to make our dollars go further. Jeff, at, at both the commission and in your more recent life, uh, you've seen a lot of what's happened on tribal lands. What are the success stories on tribal lands? Why were they a success? And what is the average story? Oh my goodness, the average story is a huge challenge. Uh, the successes, there were some early successes in, uh, there are nine fully fledged um, regulated tribally owned telcos that are just like any other telecom company in the United States. The oldest of these is over 70 years old in, in, uh, in South Dakota, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Um, there, one of the great success stories is actually in Southern California, where the Southern, Southern California, an intertribal government association, the Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association runs a 600 mile fiber wireless network for their tribes. Um, you asked a question earlier that I want to want to draw into this answer because you said, you know, what is the common experience? Um, I also don't want folks to come away from this thinking that monies in or the the orientation of funding, whether at the state, federal, or or individual level, is the big op is the biggest obstacle. There are other big ones as well. Um, so. I, I want to make sure folks know how the federal government is approaching this. When I mentioned earlier that there was a reverse auction, and that's what the RDOF is, the Rural Development Opportunity Fund, it's true what the commissioner and what Ajayal said before. It is oriented towards the bigs, the big companies, the big companies that have proven up until now that they're not interested in deploying. I said about 10 years ago, the FCC created something called the Mobility Fund, and it was a, it was billions of dollars that was aimed towards covering wireless deployment in areas that did not have spectrum. And as a portion of that, we did a tribal mobility fund that was limited only to tribal lands. And just like the commissioner's experience in the past with AT&T, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, none of those companies participated. They didn't want the obligations that came with the federal money. So we're seeing a vacuum that's being created that tribal nations are, are having to fill. And some of them are having to fill this area with one hand tied behind their back. It's not just the fiber, but there's a unique relationship in the United States between fiber, power, and the, the radio waves, the spectrum. Um, one area that has been preempted by the federal government is also, in addition to just plain regulation of the internet, is also the radio waves, the spectrum, the, 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 those little four bars in the corner of your phone that uh, represent how strong your signal is to a particular tower. Um, over any given reservation, there are approximately 60 different licenses, somewhere between 45 and 60 licenses for spectrum. And there has, over the last 20 years, a huge warehousing of spectrum licenses has occurred in the United States. 
meaning that these licenses have been given in a geographic area and there are geographic licenses in Southern California where this excellent example of a tribal network is, but those tribes don't have any access to those frequencies, to use those frequencies. So they're limited to the type of spectrum or radio waves that you use for, um, to open your garage door or to use a baby monitor for, or for um, Wi-Fi inside your house. So even with robust fiber in the ground, you need other types of equipment. Um, a lot of tribes right now are trying to pile into a window that the FCC used. Um, there's a particular area of spectrum that the FCC is making available to tribes uh, and for them to obtain license. And it's, it's pretty good spectrum, but it's just a few channels that ultimately will not be enough. So not only do we need programs, as the commissioner ex explained, that are oriented towards those that are trying to fill this gap, and it's, I'm a big fan of community networks. Tribal government networks fall into that category. If, if others are not going to build out, then we should figure out how to get the funding to those that will, because yeah, you're right, this is expensive stuff. It's gonna take on the deficit, but it gets even worse if you create some sort of stopgap measure uh, rather than fiber, like some kind of microwave, point-to-point -point microwave solution. Those, those, those are dotting the West. You, they're the big dishes that point across you know, a vast area and it, it looks like a big receiver and a big antenna. Um, that just doesn't have the capacity that fiber does. And um, so to, 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 to answer your question, there are a lot of tribes that are trying to essentially create IT departments on steroids that can run local community networks. And just like our neighbors in other communities, they're trying to address law enforcement needs, education needs, public safety, health, civic engagement, economic development needs. Um, and even though we have our own, so even though we're the third sovereign in the United States, uh, we've been on the outside of a federal process for a long time. And I do think it's important to say here, many tribes in many parts of the United States and those in California are, are included, have become very important drivers of local economies. They've brought jobs back to local regions, their employers, uh, whereas in generations past, local communities haven't had great opportunity to work together or indeed have had animosity. Now there's an opportunity to close that gap and for folks to work together. And just as tribes have brought jobs to rural communities, just like the one here in Bernalillo, New Mexico, tribes can also bring networks with our sovereignty, with our standing, with our abilities, uh, with our funding, tribal nations can become providers off reservation as well. I mentioned the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. There are communities in North Dakota that are saying, can you come serve us too? We can't get CenturyLink to come serve us. How about the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe? That's a, that's a wonderful story of history being turned on its head. And unfortunately, I think the regulators need to, to get out of the way sometimes. <laughs> um, this has been fantastic. I wanted to turn it over to a few questions that have come in the in the Q and A, um, and I'll throw this I'll throw them all out to all of you. So whoever wants to take something, um, one person is asking, could you talk a little bit about Elon Musk's Starlink Starlink program? That's the low Earth orbiting satellites that are only a couple of hundred miles up. Uh, so the you know so the uh, gap in uh, return of sound would would be barely um, barely audible and what role would private companies like star like elon musk's starlink have in providing a wireless version of uh, internet for rural areas throw it out to all of you okay Edgel, i'll put you on the spot uh, <laughs> um, so we want to provide service that has latency to rural community. We want to leave them with the worst of the worst right now. <laughs> Explain I think, latency. Go, before you go on, explain latency. <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's, it's the delay of connection because we're physically 
sing, sending the signal up and sending it down and it's it takes time it takes physical time and so um you know i think satellite solutions are uh you haven't had food in <laughs> two weeks and somebody offers you stale bread yeah <laughs> I'd probably eat it. <laughs> let me, I, let me um, I, I was taught about satellites my first time around at the FCC by some folks that I couldn't believe how much experience was. The, 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 the chief of the satellite division at the time had, had worked on the Sputnik program and had come to the, come to the U.S. One of the major challenges of, of satellites has always been, it, it's not just a latency issue, which is, which is real and is tangible, but it's also a capacity challenge. Um, and and, and our, our cousins in Alaska understand this very well because they are some of the most remote of the remote Americans, okay? And right now, the, the fiber challenges there are, are the extreme of everything you mentioned earlier about distance and terrain. Um, and so low Earth, orbit, low Earth orbit satellites are still going to have they might have less latency challenge because of distance, but there's still going to be a capacity challenge when, after this current pandemic is over and the unpleasantness is done, when the kids come home from school and at five o'clock, when everybody in a region gets on the network, it's going to boom, go down. As you experience in Alaska, when a lot of people use a network. So, um, I'm a fan of satellite for certain purposes, but it is, some of my satellite friends like to say, well, there's no rural problem. We cover all of rural America. Well, to a certain extent and at a certain cost. Um, and I know that there are certain tribal nations that have considered creating consortiums and launching their own birds, launching their own satellites. And the cost, um, I wish Mr. Musk would consider other terrestrial solutions if he wants to spend his billions. Yeah, yeah. So I worry uh, that that's more of a vanity project at the, at the end of the day than it will be uh, a reality. And I would love to read the plan. I mean, and, and you know, we can go back to that first question that you asked us, Felicity, which is what is life like without broadband? Right, so with a service that is delayed, that does not have enough capacity to even, you wouldn't be able to live stream this video, right? So is, is that the kind of service that we're proposing as a solution? I mean, um, you know, it relegates, I think, um, the communities that are uh, disconnected, um, the rural communities, the remote communities, the low-income communities, back to a place where there's just the connectivity that you would get does not actually allow you to participate in the economic, political, um, social life, uh, financial life of our nation. So is that what our, is that the best solution we can come up with? Um, it, it hurts as a rural person. <laughs> it hurts to think of like, you know, you're, you're not um, valuable enough. To, for us to figure, it, figure out how to bring the best connectivity. We've got time for, I think, one other question. And there's an interesting one that gets into a history I don't have. I'll just read it. About 25 years ago, some gas pipeline companies laid out a lot of dark fiber along their pipeline rights of way. What happened to this? Also, Global Start Satellite Phone Company had an initiative that allowed small hotspots to be set up that would use their satellites. Is this still around? This is, uh, uh, all of it is news to me. Do any of you ha have the knowledge to answer that question? Looking, looking like maybe not. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, I'm generally aware of that. Also, the, you know who else laid a lot of fiber are the railroads, the major freight railroads in the United States. Uh, the problem is uh, just like other regulated long-standing 70-year telephone companies that that turned into uh you know other other types of companies and wanted to ride the light it's about the proprietariness of their of their networks and they're willing to um uh create relationships locally and 
act as that middle mile or the backhaul for others. Um, I, I do want to say something about the importance. So there was another question in here about governance, local control, and sovereignty issues. Um, for us to close the digital divide for the rest of America, we have to recognize that there are those that want to step up and take responsibility for the debt that, they, that they're going to have to go into. And they want to work with state, county, local, tribal governments. And sometimes those are the governments themselves. Sometimes it's those governments that are trying to be the fertile field for a smaller, more market sensitive type company to come into. And we need our, our we need to utilize our sovereignty. And we are an Indian country and states should as well and the federal government should as well to recognize that, they're, that the Telecom Act of 96 didn't get it right when it came to rural America, that, that competition isn't the best business model for rural America. It might very well be moving back to some version, and this may sound heretical, but something like a monopoly. What we're trying to do is we're trying to identify the organization that is best suited to aggregate all the needs and demands of all the community institutions to be able to try to aggregate all those needs to afford the best possible solution. And that's gonna be, that's gonna take longer in certain areas than others, but um, there are many tribes that are doing that right now. They're trying to get their hands around a holistic plan that would therefore get the most buying power that they have, the largest justifications for different federal programs and different other types of programs that could justify going to that kind of debt and then be able to repay it. Because it's kind of an ugly future to look at a 70 year old business model and think, mm, I'm not sure I can really compete if everybody else is gonna be trying to steal my, my paying customers or my community or divide it. And um, I think that's very important. Um, I, I also saw a question about other technologies such as microwave and satellite in Alaska. And those are necessary, but what we want to see happen in Alaska is a prioritization for rural needs too. That that there 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 are still similar issues to those that the commissioner identified in California, present in Alaska. They're just exacerbated by distance even more. Um, and there's a great hope that somebody's going to be able to take some fiber up around the top of Alaska and be able to have some drops and places and that will, you know, that will change the field there. But um, those are my last thoughts on the three questions that I saw. Thanks. Well, that's fantastic. I welcome the contributions of all of you. I have learned so much. It's been an absolutely wonderful conversation. So Commissioner, thank you and good luck in trying to get things turned around, particularly federal things that are, are constraining you from the federal point of view. Um, <laughs> And, I'll, and Jeff, good luck in making this happen in Indian country. And it's, you've taught us so much. I love the idea that tribes may be able to provide broadband to the Anglos next to them who don't have it. That's, that's a kind of <laughs> wonderful turnaround of sovereignty. So, and thanks to everybody for joining us. Uh, it's been wonderful. Uh, we will have more of these. Just stay tuned to your emails as to what programs the Lane Center is coming up with. And, um, and if you want to read more about this, we did do a blog on it about a month ago. So thank you all very thank much. You. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye.